All right then, it's time to get started. So I'll stand up for a second and not get blinded by the projector. Okay. Pardon me. So uh, this is the migrating to Drupal session. This is, by the way, a non-technical session um, designed specifically to get your business people and your technical people aligned properly. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of introduction. Uh, Nicole and I will introduce ourselves in a minute. Um, we used to both do separate presentations. Um, Nicole talks from the project management side, I talk from the developer side. And we were at a couple of different events and we would present sort of next to each other or, or she would present and I'd present later in the day. And we just decided, why don't we merge them together so that everyone can be on the same page. So uh, Nicole can introduce herself. So yes, um, I am uh, one of the vice presidents at Phase 2 Technology. My background uh, has particularly maybe the last six years been at the enterprise level in Drupal. <laughs> at the enterprise level in Drupal. Um, uh, I've worked on, let's see, my very first kind of large scale from the United States was Lifetime TV. And it was the kind of the first site that, major site that was doing like 30 million page views a day. So it was, it, it, so at that time it was, can Drupal in fact scale to that level? So I was kind of involved in some of the early issues of scalability around Drupal. And uh, as I said, I've been in the ma uh, web management professional since 1999. So even before Drupal, um, I was in the first bust, all of that. So that's me. <laughs> okay. I'm Ken Record. I'm the director of uh, development and professional services now at uh, Palantir.net, which is a Chicago-based uh, Drupal firm. Um, I was the co-author of Drupal 7 module development, which is actually a fairly advanced technical book. Um, I've been working on the web since 1998. I'm a, an early enterprise adopter as well. Um, I'm responsible for putting the first newspaper websites on Drupal back in uh, 2005. So uh, with that said, we're going to get started. And uh, we're going to take this in a, the, what did we say, who, what? Why? Yeah, yeah, the order. We'll, our slides give the order. So essentially, one of the biggest things that you have to deal with in deciding or when an organization has made a decision to migrate and is the why. And, and it's important to establish the why because, it, as I said, is it... Ooh, as I said, is that one of the biggest reasons is due to organizational change. And what an organization is typically trying to deal with are time to market issues, integration issues, and political issues. And once you understand those organizational reasons, it actually makes um, establishing the rest of the project and the planning, and as, as Ken will start to go through, much easier. Um, and also another major reason is our budget issues. So what kinds of issues that once you've decided to migrate is what kinds of issues does Drupal kind of uniquely solve? What are those reasons that people choose Drupal? One of the biggest issues, of course, is around budget and licensing. And licensing, I've had projects where they've, you know, saved a few thousand dollars on licensing, and I've been on projects that say have a major Oracle backend, and they save several million dollars in licensing. So the larger enterprise, at least the clients that I'm working with, are often moving to Drupal because they are dealing with uh, major budget pushes by their organizations to save money. So licensing is one of the biggest issues. The second reason why I find organizations moving to Drupal is they have platform integration issues. So they have a lot of technology they're trying to package into their web solutions and they don't quite fit together or they don't play nicely together in the sandbox. So people often choose Drupal because they're trying to solve problems of integration. And then the third one is people choose Drupal because often I used to work in IT, and one of the biggest problems I had in IT were the technology wars, the vendor lock-in wars. And so I had my Cisco guys, you know, like the religious Cisco guys with my Microsoft guys, and I had my Unix, you know. It was just warfare around kind of the, the different vendors that we would use, and that I had people who were locked into them. One of the great things about choosing Drupal is you don't necessarily have those types of vendor lock-in issues. You may have favorite vendors that you're working with, but it's Drupal. I mean, so essentially you, you're, you're able to kind of pick and choose who your vendors are by and large. You, they may do it slightly different, but it is in fact the same framework. Thank you. So now that you've chosen Drupal, and one of the things about Drupal though is it doesn't need a little bit of help when you decide to jump into that migration, is that 
oftentimes there is a language problem when you're starting the migration project. And when I say language problem is you get tripped up on words. And one of the first things that I often hear is there is a module for that. <laughs> and, and this may seem like a simple thing as you're going into a Drupal migration project, but there, it implies that your site is practically built. And unfortunately, the truth is, is that you know that your site is not practically built and that oftentimes that there's a lot of customization and flexibility that folks want in their migration. And that, as you know, what comes along in the language is that I want a flexible and customized CMS. The implication is that, oh, it also is going to behave like shrink wrap software. It's going to have all the documentation. And it's not going to have any bugs. How that's not necessarily the case. Anytime you introduce customization into any kind of solution, it's going to represent a lot of other issues that you are not necessarily planning on. Another big issue around uh, the uh, language issue is our, the designs are final. I don't know how many of you worked, even not in Drupal, the, the constant designer tweaking. And so one of the funniest things, I thought this was a funny slide because I did a little bit of history on how the Mona Lisa was painted. And it was never really considered finished by Lena. Uh, it was never really con fin considered finished even after seven years. And that oftentimes the designers are constantly tweaking. They're never quite happy. And the problem is that the implication is, is that they feel that those small little design tweaks don't have any impact on what developers are going to do or the complexity of the project. And, and that those little design tweaks do in fact change things, sometimes major things, and it can change budget, it can change how long something's being implemented. I had one project one year, and in fact it was a lifetime one, where we actually had, to, at one point the designers and developers were uh, sharing the same drive where they were sharing designs. The problem is every time developers went to go pull designs, there was a new version in there. So ultimately, I had to take the designs, pull it on a secure server. So every time designers sent me designs, I'd put it on the secure servers. So that's where the developers pulled from. And the designers would be like, well, why, might, why didn't my changes make it there? And I was like, because ultimately, when you told me it was final, I moved the designs into the secure server area. So yes, important uh, issue, our designs are quite never final. Yeah, I would point out the first Drupal project I did as a, as a consultant, I had to write a report to the, to the client saying, well, between the wireframe stage and the final design stage, your design firm just added 400 hours worth of work. So, and, it, and it's just, it's really important to be very diligent on the design side. The other, the other kind of language issue, and it's related to why people move to Drupal, is Drupal is free. Yes, technically Drupal is free. There are no licensing costs. But for those of you who may have just started embarking on this endeavor of migrating, you've probably quickly learned that there are significant costs around the talent and around hosting and a, and a number of other areas. So that although you may be saving on licensing, you may be accruing a bunch of cost on tr in terms of maintaining and securing your talent, as well as configuring and setting up your hosting environment. And last but not least in the language area, it, it is really important to be very honest about a lot of these concepts. So like in the original one, uh, and I, it, I wasn't sure I was going to put this slide in, is, you know, it's kind of like the Drupal out of the box. I had the house in the box. It's similar to there's a module for that. Is you have to be really very honest with yourself. Is it, are you going to be truly happy with Drupal out of the box? Are you going to be truly, you know, it, it, happy with what, where your business requirements are and in fact how they match up against what, you know, typically Drupal offers? So in order to make your migration successful and establishing your why is getting very honest so that your migration is successful. Yeah, I would, I would throw to that um, before, as we go into the what. The, the first Drupal projects we did for newspaper businesses, essentially we would say, it's going to do 70% of what you want right now very, very quickly. And then the question for the business is, how badly do you want the other 30%? Right. So when we talk about the what, we want to talk about, so you're planning the migration. So what Nicole's been getting at is, what are the broader goals of your business? What are you trying to do? What is the purpose of moving on to Drupal? Now, you're going to need technical expertise to make that happen. And the key in this next part, when we talk about the what, is how do you make sure that the technical people are doing the right work? All right. And I would say there are three things when you're defining the goals and the targets for your, your uh, migration that you have to keep in, in mind. And we're going to look at each of these in, in turn. 
Um, and to reiterate what Nicole had said, I want you to be very, very realistic about this portion. Um, you can, it's very easy to do pie in the sky. I have big dreams. I have big ideas. I want to have everything in the world. And has anyone ever seen an enterprise SAP portal, by the way? Um, <laughs> they're brutally nasty um, conglomerations of iframes because they try to stick 18 different systems into one screen and they just don't work. They're awful because they're unrealistic. They, they try to put all the business data right at your command, right at your fingertips, but the data is all in closed systems and doesn't integrate properly. So if you're not smart about how you approach what you're trying to accomplish, you're going to end up with a really nasty system. The first part of it that I would ask you to, to start thinking about is literally your business process. And the slide here is, has people on it for a reason. Your business process is about what your people do on a day-to-day -day basis with the tools that you've given them, right? Um, process is very important and can be easily overlooked. And in particular, when you're dealing with moving on to Drupal, if you've had an existing CMS, uh, you typically have editorial processes that have already been established. And if you don't capture what those are, um, you will very frequently get bitten by the, well, we just launched the Drupal site. Why doesn't it allow us to paste a Word document in? Right. Oh, well, no one ever put that in the requirements. Right. That's a classic. So capture your business processes. Understand what they're supposed to be. The second aspect of that is the business logic. The business logic is almost literally, I can, okay. Sorry. My computer, she can't touch it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, business logic is the, the stupid stuff that, com that machines do, right? The business process is almost entirely driven by people. The logic are the hard, fast rules that you teach your mach machines and you're going to program into your code. Uh, capturing the business logic tends to be, as an outside consultant, extremely painful um, because people don't really know how to write it down. They know that they have rules, but they're never codified, or you get cases where I just had someone say, well, we have an e-commerce product, and there's 3,000 different pricing models. Okay, we'll document those for us. Well, that process alone is going to take them three months. Um, and they don't want to do it, but we'll get to that later. Um, the third part of that is uh, business data. So the business data is really the raw stuff that you're bringing across. Uh, and when we typically talk about migrations, we talk about data migrations. But again, I want to capture all three of those elements. And when we get to the actual implementation, we'll talk about it. And what I really want to say about it is this is actually hard work. The, the biggest hurdle, and I'm actually fighting this with a client right now, this is not work that your external consultants can do for you unless you're willing to pay them a lot of money and open up all of your business processes to them. Um, you can do it, but it's very, very difficult um, and puts, it can put a lot of strain on the relationship if you're working with external vendors if you're not willing to put in the time. Um, because the fact of the matter is your people can do this work faster and cheaper than I can. If you have to bring me in to learn how everything about your business, um, that's going to take a long, long time. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to talk about are things that are going to make it easier for you, make it a little more fun. Um, I love this little slide. So, um, One of the things, and I think this is a theme that runs throughout the DrupalCon, so I, I, I think it's important to have this slide here, is um, a culture of transparency. This goes, how many of you were at the keynote this morning, by the way? Uh, so, so what Anka was saying, I think, applies to the kind of business logic we're, we're discussing. If you really want to capture exactly how to get the work done properly, you have to be very, very open and very, very honest about what's in there. And I, I use Drupal here as an example because um, communities like ours and software projects like ours will fail if there's no transparency. If people are making decisions in back rooms and when the developers don't know why or the marketers don't know why, um, it's going to sow distrust. It's going to um, lead to schism. It's going to lead to, to forked projects. So these ideas that are very, very um, almost, I wanted to say, sacred in the open source community, uh, the open sharing of information, a clear definition of roles, an agreement on the key issues, and a, sh and a sense of shared responsibility is really, really vital. So um, the, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that. What's hard about working on a project, and it, de it really depends on the project, so although you may have established the why, and it may have matched kind of your budget decisions to move to Drupal or your integration issues, your organization that you're working with may not have bought into this culture of transparency, which makes the migration project even harder. 
Okay. So I wanted to add that. And in many cases, my argument would actually be that the introduction of Drupal and open source technologies give you a great opportunity to start this conversation, which can be very, very transformative in, a, in an organization. Um, it can be very, very difficult, but I recommend it highly. Um, at the very least, your team needs to be transparent. I love this little black box slide. I use it a lot, um, and I modified it for my German audience. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons that I love Drupal is I used to work with a bunch of C and Oracle engineers, and if I needed anything done, I might give them some inputs. I'd tell them what my business process was, what my logic was, and then they went off and did something in a black box. And the black box is you know, where, the, where the black sheep hide. Where the magic happens. Dirt, it's where the magic happens. <laughs> Right. But who knows what's coming out of the black box? You might get schnitzel, you might get a, a sausage, right. but you don't want that. You want a new website. So right. avoiding this, um, the key to that is open communication, right? Open and transparent communication by all the stakeholders on the project. Um, the last part I want to talk about when we're getting to this um, pre-planning from a technical standpoint is very, very rarely are you going to have an open green field in front of you. Right? Green fields are great. Green fields mean I can do whatever I want. There are no limits. There are no prior expectations. Um, but you have to plan because you're almost, oh, again, if you're dealing with a migration, you already have systems in place. And you have to know what they are and how they work. Um, and to do that, you have to ask the right questions. And so I want to hit on a couple of key questions when you're talking about what does it look like if you're doing a migration project. And the first of those is, are you doing an actual migration or are you doing an ongoing in integration? And there's, this is a whole separate topic that we could spend an entire session on. Um, but a migration is a single use. I am get, taking data out of system A, typically something like my old Oracle system, and I'm putting it into Drupal and I'm never going to touch Oracle again, which is how you save a lot of money. Um, an integration is a repeated process which says, no, I still need my Oracle data. I'm, I have people updating that frequently through a, a web app or some, some other legacy system that I can't get rid of or don't want to get rid of, and I need to bring that over all the time. So uh, you have to make that plan up front. I actually have a client right now, too. It happened twice. We signed on to do migrations, and they want continuous integrations, and their budget went. Right. So, um, Question number two is, is your data any good? This is what I call the hierarchy of pain. Um, MySQL and Postgres SQL data for Drupal installation or for Drupal migrations is, is great. It's perfect. It's easy. It's native. Uh, Drupal knows how to read it. Um, no problem. Any other form of, of SQL data is usually pretty good, although it can be a little tough to get data out of Oracle. Um, that's not a big deal. XML data is great. I once did a migration uh, that was 14,000 XML documents. Not a problem. HTML is a little tricky if you actually are in the position where you need to migrate raw HTML. You can find me later. I'll give you some tips. And then in some cases, people just have a bunch of old Word documents lying around that they want to put in the CMS. And, and what I would say is um, you want to have a plan B. Everyone would like to have a nice automated process right? A big, shiny, gleaming Porsche that goes down the highway and brings all your data across. But if you literally have a bunch of old Word documents, you're basically stuck with a broken down old pickup truck that won't do anything. And you might actually be better off hiring an army of interns to just manually enter all your data. Um, we had a case where that just happened. And we, in, in hindsight, we should have hired the interns. Okay. The last uh, two bits that you want to think about is how do you review when you're done with a migration? This particularly goes to the business data, because if you're doing an automated data migration, computers are not perfect. Computers are, in fact, quite stupid. They can only do what you want. And we'll talk a little bit later about what do you do when the data is not what you expect. And really, I would say, what are your editors going to be doing, your marketing people, the folks who are responsible for your web platform? How are they going to interact with Drupal in that sort of pre-launch phase after we've transferred everything over? So have a plan for re that review up front, right? Um, those are the three major questions there. How will editors interact with it? What's the workflow going to be? And uh, how do you handle the updates? So very important questions. So after that, you, you're ready to talk process, right? Who's actually going to do the data migration? How often is it going to happen? When is it going to be considered complete? And from a project management perspective, what is dependent on it? It's that critical path of planning. If you need to be able to do you know, editing, uh, and sometimes this is very frequent, you have to do content proliferation 
on top of the data migration. And you can't start the content proliferation or the editing process of making the site ready to go live until the migration is done. So finding that critical path becomes very, very important and is really the job of your team. So once you've answered the why and the what, it becomes the who. And the reason why who is important is because people are, I could say 99% of the time, your biggest risk in a migration project, and it's not the technology. From experience, I can tell you that. And the reason why is because actually deciding to do a migration, to do a Drupal migration, it introduces a, quite a bit of change into the organization. And remember, you, the reason why you're going is that you may have budgetary issues, you may have time to market issues, and those types of issues often kind of start to impact people and their job descriptions start to change. It starts to change who people are reporting to. And unfortunately, it often leads to people losing their jobs because they become obsolete. They may be working on a system that, you know, they can't necessarily make the skip over to Drupal or they don't want to make the skip or they don't have the skills to do it. So the type of change that going in a migration introduces quite a bit of change on the people who are having to execute it or not execute it. The other thing that happens and why people are so important in it is, is the speed of change. And so if you go too slow to accommodate all the nervousness and all of the issues of the indiv individuals involved, you may not make your targets for budget. You may have, you may want to avoid paying your licensing fees for the next year, so it's going to make you rush a little bit faster than you should be. So, you know, rushing or going uh, too slow can impact how people actually respond to the project. Your, your ideal situation is to find that nice middle road where you keep your people kind of psychologically happy and sane, but at the same time that you're meeting the, the business drivers of why you've actually decided to do the migration in the first place. Right, but that's tough because the first migration I ever did... Yeah, it never happens that way, hard, by the way. <laughs> it, it, it had a hard deadline, and I... No one ever said it, but I am convinced that if they missed the deadline, they had to pay about a quarter million dollars in licensing fees. Right. Yeah, it, it, this is not something that's easily solved. It, it is it's quite a bit of massaging, and, you know, one of the things, how I'm kind of recommending solving it is the next set of slides. It's not, you, you cannot necessarily control the speed of change or the type of change, but you can work with the types of personalities that start to emerge out of the out of the actual migration. And the first personality that actually emerges is your evangelist. The evangelist is the person who sold Drupal. They think this is, you know, this is the good idea. This is the technology that should be used. And they're going to they're gonna sell it. They're going to sell it to the organization. And they're going to say, this is, this is what we should be doing, and this is why. The, the caveat is, depending on how they've sold Drupal, you may actually find yourself having to deal with the language issues that I talked about earlier. You know what? You're Oftentimes, when someone's selling Drupal to the organization, they're saying, oh, you're going to get all, all of this out-of-the-box functionality. Oh, there's a module for that. So they're, they're selling Drupal, but they're using language that's not clearly defined. So that is one of the hardest things about your, your evangelist is very important to the migration, but you have to kind of be there to mediate the expectations that they're setting and clear up the language problems that are being introduced. The second type that always emerges is I call them the passive-aggressive type. And the passive-aggressive is usually a, not, a, a fairly indirect person. They're not that person who's saying, no, I don't want to do this, at least in public. They're that person who's sending the kind of sly emails, taking shots at, you know, certain people in the project. And so that passive-aggressive person, although can, as I said, be very quiet, they can undermine your migration by just little simple things. And how you have to deal with this passive-aggressive personality in a migration project is you have to call them out, unfortunately. And then I know a lot of folks don't like to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be like an aggressive confrontation, but you do need to call them out and, and have them understand that even the little things that they're doing is in fact undermining your efforts. The third person is not someone who's going to send sly little emails and do it behind your back. They're actually going to be in the meetings 
openly telling you this is a terribly bad idea. You should not be moving to Drupal. I don't like the way you're doing this. And they're openly hostile to your actual efforts. They, the unfortunate part is that this person is usually motivated by fear and uncertainty. It may be the type of change that's happened, the change issues. And so it could be that they feel under, the underlying issues that they may be losing their job. They're reporting to someone that they don't want to report to. So usually your openly hostile person is in fact being driven by fear. And how you deal with this person is you try to find a responsibility for them. You try to give them a sense of ownership. The problem is if you can't find that, and it sometimes happens, you have to get them out of your project. You may not be able to fire them, but you're going to have to make a case to get them out because an openly hostile person, it, it is so painful to do a migration and you have someone sitting in your meetings just confronting you every minute of the day telling you this is a bad idea. It starts to take an impact on the morale of the group. The next person I call the know-it-all, and the know-it-all, and again, no offense to any, um, or you know, just I usually call these my Java developers, and so you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, no offense. Um, I, I've done a number of migration projects where we'll go into the organization or been, been my organization and they may have had a, a, a group of technical folks who are very experienced. They may be very, very experienced on the web, but they don't know Drupal. And so you have a, 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 a group of people who are telling you this is raw, you know, this is not the right way to do it and they're able to actually engage you technically you know, but, but there are some differences. There are some significant differences. And that the way you would do a Java project is very different than the way you would do a Drupal project. And so I call these the know-it-alls. And the way that you usually deal with know-it-alls, and I'm telling you this works 95% of the time, is you have to train them. Just because someone is technical does not mean that they know Drupal. And I have been engaged in projects where we're bringing Drupal in and they expect those other technical folks who don't know Drupal to just pick it up and implement it, and it just doesn't work that way. They usually become very unhappy and dissatisfied, but when training is actually introduced, and technical training at that, they, they are like, oh, okay. So they feel a lot more empowered in the project. So training is critical to this, um, in terms of dealing with this type of person. The other person, and uh, Ken talks about him, and again, I, there's a synonymous relationship between the apathetic personality type and the editorial staff. Your editorial staff, essentially, or your apathetic individuals, will actually sit in the project on the sidelines for months and have nothing to say. They never have any input on the front side. No. Never. Nothing. And no. you may even go ask them. I've, I've had projects where, you know, you have the, the business analysts, the designers go in, meet with all the editorial staff, and what do you think? And oh, that's fine. Love it. That's fine. As soon as you finish building something, you get that administrative system set up, and you roll it out, they're horrified. <laughs> and then quickly they revert from the apathetic person to the openly hostile or a passive-aggressive member. So just how you, sorry, it's all right, you can, and how you deal with this person, what is very important is in the upfront, as Ken talked about, is making sure you get their business process. And it, getting their business process means extracting it by sitting them in front of a computer and showing them demos, showing them other systems that you bought, kind of walking them through what the interfaces may actually look like and experience. That's one big deal, big way to impact it, and the other is, after each build, every, every component that you put through, don't ever think it's too soon to introduce something to the editorial staff. They may be apathetic about it, but at least you're kind of dragging them in front of the system and showing them pieces at a time. So that's also very important. Now I can move on. The next, this is kind of an interesting member, and, and these, this person actually originates in some of the larger projects, and they're, and they're never like the CTO of the organization or the CIO. It's, it's just some kind of amazing like production manager who kind of arises out of the, the weeds, who, who, who becomes the champion of the actual implementation. They, they become that central person that the developers go, well, what did you mean by this? And what happened to that part of the budget? The, I call this person the protector, and it's never usually someone in a significantly kind of lofty leadership role. They're just someone who, who, who can work hard and is, is committed to getting the project done. And what do you do with this member? And how do you deal with them? And, Normally how I deal with this member is I take them out for drinks and dinner. <laughs> so so um, it, it, you're smoothing with this person because they, they're the glue who is actually making this project get done. 
they're and 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 they are a magical individual. So and you will you will know and just don't assume that they are a lofty you know titled person. And and then the last person that you're going to encounter, and this is kind of the, it, and this often is your, it sh well, I won't say often, it should be your project manager. And this is the person who is going to understand the strategy, the language, the people, you know, the technology they're going to work with, your lead develop. They are going to be the, the person who pulls everything together. They're not necessarily the protector. They, they, they can execute on the pieces of all the pie and they can put everything together. They are, the only problem about this particular member of the project is they're not always well liked. And the reason why they're not well liked is because they have to be somewhat hard and, and make some decisions and push things through that people are not always going to appreciate. And that the main thing that you have to do with this member, if you are kind of in somewhat of control of a project is to give them authority over the project. You don't ever want your project manager to ha not have enough authority to actually fulfill this role in a project. So last but not least is that people are your key assets in you know, any migration project. They are, they are so critical to the success of your migration efforts. Do not underestimate kind of the roles that I talked about and how the uh, speed and types of change uh, impact how your folks will actually behave in a migration. Yeah, and as we go into the how, and this is the execution phase, when we actually get developers involved, I would say it's funny because the most successful migration I ever had, um, I was on site working with it, and we we're running into some really nasty problems. And finally, for the first time in, there were two people on the project who had worked in the same building for 20 years and had never really spoken. One of, them, one of them was an Oracle DBA who was responsible for store housing, you know, storing all the data. The other was the head librarian who was responsible for putting the data in the system. But they had never talked about why the system does what it does. And they had to sit together for about three hours and solve a, t a really thorny um, technical problem for me. And it was, it was fascinating because they both went from sort of passive aggressive to protector very, very quickly yes, when they finally fast. realized that they were actually in alignment and if they succeeded, they were going to be rewarded. That was right. great. So in the how, the first thing is actually to identify the team. Who's going to be involved in your migration process? And part of it is, is it an internal team or an external team? Um, I've been part of both. Um, I've been part of mixed teams also. Um, I just rolled off a very successful migration where my job was to coach the internal staff on how to do the technical implementation. Um, that worked really, really well. Um, there are uh, pros and cons to both, of, uh, both effects or, or both approaches, uh, but you do need to be aware. And these are the sort of roles that you'll need on the, on the team. You'll need someone who's a data architect, which means someone who really understands all the data that goes to your system. Um, you'll need some programmers, and, and you may need more than one of each of these roles. You'll need a business analyst. Um, You'll need an editor, you'll need a project manager, and then you'll have numerous stakeholders. Um, and those people will all fall into the different you know, personalities that Nicole has gone through. Can I add one thing to that slide? Now, just understanding the, the kind of size of certain projects is that you will have people who wear two or three of those hats. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that there is at least a minimum of, what is that, seven roles, right. seven people on a project. You may actually only have two or three, but you still have to fulfill those roles. Right, but on the last, so on, for example, on the last migra migration that I did, um, it was an external migration. Well, if you're, even if you're hiring external consultants, your internal team is going to have to do some work. This is the big thing. So on the last migration that I had to do personally, I was both the data architect and the programmer, and I was essentially having to beg the client to do business analysis. It's like, I need a business analyst because I don't understand anything about your data. And there's no way for me to understand anything about your data, right? Because there's too much of it. And it's, it's all very typically domain specific, which means very, if, if you're an architecture firm, it's all about architecture. I don't know anything about architecture. You know, I know newspapers. But, <laughs> so. Um, so then now you can write code. You've got a team in place. You can, you can get started. You just, no, no. No, no, no. I have a guy right now who <laughs> works for me. Um, he writes about, he, he maintains about 50 modules on Drupal.org. He loves to write code. He, he's awesome. And he's ready to do his first data migration, and I won't let him. 
<laughs> because they haven't finished doing the analysis yet. And, and I've actually done enough of these that I've come up with a decent format and I've, I've cribbed it onto the next couple of slides. This is all, right now we're talking about business data, bringing it across. And, uh, how does that get into your Drupal site? Um, and these techniques will work even if you're not migrating onto Drupal. If, if you're here doing due diligence and you decide after this conference that you're not going to go to Drupal, you might go to Joomla, you still need to go through this process, right? Um, so the first thing you have to do is map your data sources. And uh, these are basically very, very simple um, worksheets that you should put together that everyone on the team can read and agree to. Now, I don't have a lot of room on these slides, but the notes are designed to be um, human readable, right? The rest of it is technical information for your, your software developers, right? So you have a, you might in, this is our hypothetical database of, of stories from a newspaper system. And we're pulling these out of the Oracle. So this is a map that says, hey, here's the Oracle data that you're going to see when you start doing this migration. There's a title, there's an abstract, there's a last updated field, and then there are some topics. And the type is really just technical stuff. You don't need to worry about it right now. Um, this import, yes or no, this is where the business analyst comes in. It's like, hey, do we care about this data point? Right? Well, last updated in this version is irrelevant. The reason it's irrelevant is we're just going to start over. We're just going to, we know that everything's going to get updated after we do the migration, so the fact that an editor might have touched this nine months ago is irrelevant, so let's just drop that. Um, and the notes are also interesting because the notes will help you capture um, information about how things relate to other, um, where it says topics from topic list, the implication here is you're going to write these data source maps for every type of data you're bringing across. And very typically, you're bringing across multiple data types. You might be bringing across some users. You might be bringing across some stories. And here, I'm assuming you're going to bring across some topics, so, so a categorization or a taxonomy system. Um, and what I'm, what I'm making a note here is, hey, developers, note that when you hit this topic bit, it refers to this other piece of data that we're going to talk about in another slide. Well, we're not going to talk about it on this slide, but that's the full technical talk. The second part to that is once, and, and that part has to come first, and I actually have a client right now who's really, really angry at us because we asked them to do this. Because they handed us like 18 data tables and we don't know what they are. Now, to be honest, they can pay us an awful lot of money for us to guess. And what they're going to get if they make us guess is we're going to hand them this document and then make them, wa make them walk us through it to make sure we haven't screwed anything up. Um, Something answering a phone. So <laughs> after you've done that, your data architect can then map the data from the external system to the Drupal system. Uh, Drupal works essentially in a series of uh, collected objects that they call entities. And so every piece of business data you have will map, for the most part, will map to an entity type. And so here we've created a story uh, entity type, and it has fields. You know, data storage that map to our external data. Um, and all I'm doing in this case is mapping the sources from the first list to the targets on the second list. This is your roadmap for your development team because you're, you're going to be telling them, I need you to create this type of entity and I need you to rip this data in, from in this format to the new system. All right? This is, this is written by whoever's doing the actual implementation. Then you review it with the client, right? particularly the protector, yes. somebody who knows the, the system, who knows what are the targets we're trying to hit, and have we mapped the data appropriately? And there are two slides, I think, that help with that. Um, like I said before, you very typically have relationships between those entities. So this is from a migration that I did where we would import a story, but the story might be part of a collection of stories. The story might also be tagged by topics, and the story might also have an attached contributor. And so knowing how those things interrelate becomes very, very important because quite frequently, well, in fact, always, when you're doing a data migration in an automated way, the order in which you do something matters. So in this case, I can't import stories until I import contributors because I have to attach the contributor information to the story information. And that becomes really, really essential. So getting a good understanding of those, of those data relationships is vital. Um, and I found this slide yesterday when I was looking, uh, and I'm, I'm going to actually stand up and explain it. Um, when I talked about business logic earlier, this is a great example of business logic. Uh, this is actually from the first migration I ever did. This is foreignaffairs.com, which is the leading political science publication in the United States. Um, 
Essentially, all U.S. foreign policy in the last 60 years started in foreign affairs. That's, that's what they do. And they have a very, very specific publishing um, rule set, which basically says um, someone looks for an article online, is it, is it under copyright? Does foreign affairs hold the copyright to it? If, if yes, we go in one direction. If no, um, we display a message that says, we're sorry, the article you're looking for is, is not under copyright. We can't, print, we can't display it to you on the web. Here's the issue you can go look for in the library. Um, but they're, you know, is it marked as freely viewable, right? Because they're a pay service. Uh, if it's free, we can display it. If the user is authenticated against their registration and subscription system, we can display it. Um, they have a concept of user licenses, which means that a university uh, can buy a license, and we know if you come from the university network, you're treated like a subscriber, which was a fascinating piece of code to write. Right? But this, is, this one in particular is an idea of business logic translated into code. So capturing your business logic and being able to, everyone on the project, not everyone, but the business owner, the, the stakeholders have to be able to explain this to the developers in a, in a rational way. Typically what happens is the developers will map this out and then say, is this correct? And you'll, go, you'll iterate through it until you get it right. And, and I, would, I would just add, and I've had a number of projects where, say, I didn't early on collect these artifacts, and that, and when I didn't collect them, and as the non-technical person, I found developers having to go through multiple iterations that they shouldn't have had to go through to get the data correct, and that, and, and then, and again, it could have been easily avoided had I had gone through these steps. Right, and this is the argument I'm having with my my client right now is. They don't think they should have to do right. this. They see it as a technical exercise. Right. And they don't understand the value. They, they don't understand how it's going to save time in the long run is the weird right. part. Um, the next thing you actually have to do as a developer, uh, and it's helpful if you can get someone who knows the data, um, but you're going to have to track what are called exceptions. Exception handling is the least fun part of programming, I'll, I'll tell you flat out. And exceptions are, well, in our Oracle data set, everything should have a title, but occasionally we might have goofed and there might not be a title. Okay, well, what do I do in that case? Oh, skip the record and flag it. Um, flag it for review by the editorial staff, but don't bother importing it. Um, what if the story title is in all caps? I actually had this one on, on Foreign Affairs. Every once in a while they have a title in all capital letters, and that might be correct, but it's probably not. Um, and that's something you could correct programmatically, but it really takes a human editor to know. And so when we talk about editorial tools here in a little bit, that's an, uh, something you can flag for editorial review. And typically when I do data migrations, um, I'll have additional fields in my story concept, in my story object in Drupal, that allows me to tag specific exceptions so that when editors are going through to review things, they can say, okay, find me everything that has a, is flagged as having a bad title. And they can fix all of those at once. Um, or find me everything where there's HT, complex HTML embedded in my story, right? Um, this last one is very important here for the Germans. Um, UTF-8, Drupal does everything in UTF-8, which is the um, language standard, the coding standard for supporting things like the double S in Strasse. Um, <laughs> Non-UTF-8 non -UTF systems can explode if you don't properly encode the, the double S. <laughs> um, so you literally have to flag it in the code. Hey, what do I do if I hit non-UTF-8 data? Um, the worst case for this, by the way, is if you get a lot of Microsoft data uh, from Microsoft Word, which uses its own special encoding and causes us to cry. Um, so as you're going along, and some of this you will do up front, and, and I will say uh, this is actually Nicole's area of expertise. If you want to talk about risk management, you should ask her uh, at, during the question and answer or, or a little bit later. But you should be tracking risks. As a developer, you should be reporting to the project manager, hey, I'm starting to see some really bad data here. Um, now, when we do risk tracking, typically there's a matrix of how, how important is it? How badly should we freak out? And, and essentially, we have here the columns. What's the chance that this happens? And if it does happen, what's the impact of it? And then what you have to do is come up with a mitigation strategy. So, okay, what do you do if you have bad data? 
Now, we're trusting that we're going to have good, so there's low chance that this is actually going to occur. But if it does occur, it's totally critical because it halts us on the critical path of the project. The only mitigation strategy at that point is to delay until the data can be corrected. Right? And I just had a project like this where it turns out that all the client was able to give us was 65 separate comma separated values lists, which were basically just exports from Excel. Um, we should have just let interns do it because we didn't have a, a smart way to analyze the risk of what was happening. By the time we realized how bad the impact was, it was too late to fix it. So ideally, you will set some risks up doing, during the data analysis phase, and you'll be able to say, all right, team, especially to the chief, right. these are the things I'm worried about. So let's keep an eye on them, right? Uh, missing, missing documentation, I flagged as high here. That's, no one knows what this data is. We're just kind of making it up. Frequently, as a, as a contractor, when I come in, you'll find like we're replacing um, custom systems that were built by someone 15 years ago who hasn't worked there for six years, and no one knows how it works, which is not a lot of fun. So once you've done this pre-planning, then there's the go, no-go question. It's like, OK, are we ready to go? Um, I actually think you're ready to go once you have your targets mapped. Um, I think you can move forward with you can move forward without doing all the exception handling as long as you know that you have to do it. I think you can move forward without doing risk mitigation as long as you know how to, that you have to do it. Um, but that is something that the team needs to decide because it, it is a risk. Anytime you're moving forward without having all that information, you're opening the project up to the risk of failure. So it is a team decision to go. Once the team says go, then you can write code. And this is actually what I'm doing on the migration project right now is I'm the gatekeeper telling the programmer when it's okay to move forward, right? And he's not moving forward until I tell him. Um, I'm gonna skip very quickly through, there are a lot of Drupal tools. If you're reading through the program or, or see or hear people talking about any of these things, these are all useful things for you in your data migration. Uh, the migrate module is sort of the gold standard right now. Uh, feeds module can be used. Drush is very important. Devel is a developer's tool. And views is great for editors. And I did put in a little slide here to say, hey, these are some other sessions. I think some of these may have already happened. Um, these are all technical sessions, however, about data migration, um, data and business logic migration that are during DrupalCon. And just a quick question, just, just so I understand the audience. I should have asked this at the very beginning. How many of you are technical or just or more business related? So technical and then the business folks. Yeah. See, this is why we decided to do this session yeah. together, because that was what was always happening. I would do a business session, and I would have a group of technical folks, and then I would never get technical enough. And then, so, OK, continue. <laughs> I just, the, first, the first presentation I ever did that was any good was at a newspaper conference, and it was how to manage developers in your newsroom and how developers should talk to managers, because I was both a developer and a manager in the middle of a newsroom. And it was, it was about this very communications problem, about making sure everyone knows what's going on. So I, I'll just sort of throw out two very quick screenshots. Migration module is very, very nice, because when you're done doing all that data mapping and actually write the code, it gives you a user interface to verify everything, which is really, really nice. It also gives a lot of tools for automating the migration and scripting the import um, and, and duplicating the import. So you can run it over and over again and test it over and over again, which is really, really nice. And I, I would say Views is great for building editorial tools and, and for the developers in there. Um, plan this out, especially when you're doing exception handling, when you run into things in the data that you're like, this doesn't look right to me, but I don't know what to do with it. You can build in fields, like I said, to flag that so that then editors can go and search through the list of content and find things that they have to review. Uh, very, very helpful technique. Um, the guys at Chapter 3 out in San Francisco actually pioneered this technique because I did a presentation with them in Boston. Um, the last thing that I say that I think is really, really important about this is you have to track changes. Um, you do run into problems occasionally, especially if you're doing an integration and not a one-time migration, where your data targets, you know, your, the target mapping you did might not be accurate, and you might find halfway through the project, oh, wait, I have to make this small change to the way I'm handling the abstract field. Please, please iterate your documents. Iterate your documentation. Excuse me, so that the folks who come behind you know what you did. Right. 
Once you did that, you, you've got the code set up, you're running it, you have to test it. You have to test it. Did, did the car target objects get created correctly? Did fielded data come across correctly? Um, did the relationships between the data objects uh, come across properly? Um, you have to check that all very, very strictly. And this is something that programmers can do, and the, the programming team will want to do this before you unleash the editors on it. And the other thing you'll want to do before you unleash the editors on it is test it again. Um, can the process be repeated? Right? Yeah, it works great on your system. It works great on your test system. Does it work on the client system? I just had a problem where we had a, a fatal non-replicable bug on the live web server, and it turned out to be, and I could not reproduce it on, on this very computer, it tur turns out, because I was using PHP 5.3 and the live web server using PHP 5.2, and there were significant differences that caused the process to fail on the live server. Yeah, he just hung his head in shame. <laughs> yep, yep. It happens. Um, and it can be performed by the team. This is also very important. We, I mean, we just went through a very delicate process of we have this tricky migration with 65 separate CSV files. Now they want to run it themselves. So we have to train them up on how to do it. When that's done, then you turn everything over to editorial, edit, editor review. And I've got to say, you must schedule this step in. Human editors must review things because machines are dumb. And programmers are smart, but they're dealing with dumb machines. So you have to schedule time in here. And editors, remember, they will remain apathetic until they see something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to introduce them early. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't actually have when in our title, but it, we actually added this last slide. It's, it's not a big section. It was essentially you couldn't actually answer when you're going to do a migration until you know the why, until you know the what, until you know the who, and until you know the how. So essentially, once you know those four things, you can then do the when. You can then start answering things like schedule. It's very painful for someone who does you know, migration projects or implementations or just projects in general when there's already a preset schedule and you don't even have the requirements or the plan. So the when can only come after you've done all of the, fir the first four steps. We just had to do that on our, my, the client who's arguing, we just had to extend the schedule. Yes. Because they couldn't, they couldn't deliver the data in time to stay on schedule. Right. And last but not least, and that we kind of thought about our themes in our presentation. And the first one of any successful migration is don't rush. There are many steps that have to be followed in order to get a successful migration. If you skip any of them, you are putting your project, which is the second part of this, is at risk. And granted, every project has risk, and, and it is managing your risk and tracking your risk. Very important in a project. Also is planning. Planning, and, and I, I, actually it's planning, and it's not just planning ahead. It's, it's just general, solid planning. And there is detailed technical planning. The stuff that Ken went through is critical and it, why I'm so happy to be presenting with him today because those are artifacts that I have to, on the project side, must track in order to get a successful project. As much as I don't want to have to push my clients to it and as much as I don't want to have to track it because it is very detailed, it makes the all of the difference in the world. And last but not least is communicating. It is extremely important that you communicate. It, you saw how technical and how many steps are involved and all of the people issues. If you are not communicating successfully in your project work, it will not uh, succeed or it will actually be very stressful. So without further ado. We do have seven minutes for questions. <laughs> so, uh, questions? So, I will repeat. So the question was, uh, do you have any suggestions for how to communicate or tools and how often, how frequently? Yes? That's actually an excellent question. And I often write into our project briefs what the communication plan is. I actually formalize communication plans. And communication plans first include where are you putting the documentation? What is, where is, where is your sales, your, your central repository for documentation? Email is not a good central repository. So the first is where are you putting your stuff? I don't care if it's a base camp, a custom project management tool, whatever, the, a shared server, it should be clearly understood where all 
iterative and final documentation will go for the project. And that includes project plans, and it includes um, designs, whatever it is. The second part is, is how often are you going to talk to each other? And so if, depending on the size of the project, so for my smaller endeavors, I may meet twice a week, 30 minutes which is sufficient enough. And we go over you know, the status, that type of thing. For larger kind of enterprise level, I actually conduct a daily scrum or a daily stand-up. And I, those are a 15 minute stand-up. I have the project, the key project stakeholders who are involved in the day-to-day -day -day decisions as well as the developers are on the call. And, and that is a 15 minute stand-up. So that is part of the communication vehicle. I've actually put another layer of communication in and that, and, and this is just up to you, but I like the frequency of it is we use a lot of chat so we have like a lot of group chat where we are just in you know at each other all day you have a quick question you don't have to wait for your daily scrum or you don't have to wait for that you know your weekly st you know your weekly status you don't have to wait for the email you basically if you have a question an immediate one you'll send out a chat so th there are multiple levels of communication and I think uh, formalizing it so that everybody understands where they get to communicate is important because th that is one of the stressful things if you have a question and it's an urgent question you don't know who to go to or when formalize it get it out there and you know make sure you follow it and you're disciplined with it so that would be my recommendation from the development side we, we have dedicated IRC channels yeah. for our projects where we can just everyone who's working on it can hang out and ask questions we did a huge project with Acquia and four other partners where we had a dedicated Skype hangout, which was right. kind of wild. But yeah, chat, just like some way to have an immediate way of asking questions. Yeah. So the question was, can you deliver this in an incremental way, or is it always one big go, um, you know, one big chunk? You can do it incrementally, uh, I would say. You have to plan that pretty carefully. Um, I have done, I did one case where the project had such tight deadlines for deliverables that we had to um, do it in phases. And we had to say, okay, during this phase, we're going to pull this data across. And during the next phase, we'll pull this data across. Um, that's a little easier to do, I think, with ongoing integration work um, than with actual data migration work. I, what I would say, though, on the incremental side, related to that, even in a migration, that if, if the owner of the content is comfortable with not having certain content make it, say, for launch, mm -hmm. that's, I've, I've often found that a client or the content owner has to usually wait to get all their content. They, it's probably 90% of the time they don't get everything at one time. So, so the, on the incremental side of things, it, it, is there, do you, would you see there's kind of anything technically in, incremental other than the content not all coming over at the same time? You can, you can increment the technical phases. I mean, there's, there's no reason not to do it incrementally. You can do it, you can do it either way. I, I'm not sure I have a more coherent way to yeah, say Yeah, I would just say it's more about what, what your end users could live with in terms of having the final data available, you know, on say your public but facing typ site. Typically the problem we run into is that you have to get the core data in and then editors start building off of it. And so you very frequently we find ourselves in cases where no, we have to bring everything over at once because it's on the critical path to getting the site launched. Right. But but that's again a business decision, not necessarily a technical decision. Right. The tools and the, it's interesting, the tools in Drupal are mature enough that it's not a technical barrier to do it in phases. So we, we solve all the problems you're ever <laughs> going to have. That is very exciting. But it also means that we get you to lunch early. Two so minutes early. You. Yeah, two minutes early. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.